Today, we are happy to have Ibrahim Abba from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he will tell us about uh, topological solitons in gravity. Okay, good. So thanks for the invitation and uh, thanks for having me. Um, so the, the um, I'll tell you about some work here later. That sort of appeared over over the last three two three years with with my post up here, um, and so okay. So to just start off with some broad motivation of why um, you'll see some of the stuff that you're going to see is uh, recently, of course, we all know about the detection of gravitational waves. And um, from many perspectives, this is a start of, of the field of gravitational spectroscopy for ultra compact uh, objects uh, 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 that you might see in the sky. And the question that has emerged is, what should be the um, spectrum of ultra compact objects in series of gravity that you might see um, uh, in the future? And in the future here, we're talking about within um, 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 two, three decades. On the other hand, uh, one thing that we know have understood over the years in, in, in gravity, in supergravity and string theory and, and so on, is that we can have coherent states which are described by smooth horizontal solutions in, in, in supergravity theory. And um, these are particularly important in holography when we want to do precision holography. They show up uh, a lot. And also they show up in what's usually often called uh, microstate uh, uh, geometry. So there is also another question that you could ask coming from here is, can you have coherent states of quantum gravity that we are used to thinking about from strings where there is supersymmetry exist in non VPS as non VPS objects uh, in generic theories of gravity, which might have an implication for this broader question of trying to understand spectrum of ultra compact objects that could eventually show up in, in, in these new detectors. So as soon as you ask such a question, you can sharpen it a bit more. What we really want is, can we have a notion of solitons in gravity, which can show up in, 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 in gravitational spectroscopy? And by that, what we would want to have is some, a set of objects that are asymptotically flat, they're smooth, they're horizonless, and sufficiently compact um, that they mimic a black hole, but are not uh, a, a black hole. They must have finite energy density, and if they have charges, finite, and they have to be classically stable and at least metastable from a gravitational point of view. So this would be the question that you would ask following those, those, those motivations. And as soon as you start here, we already know um, why this is a hard question, because we're used to thinking about solutions and, and, and smooth objects in, 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 in supergravity precisely because there is supersymmetry. And once we try to give up supersymmetry, um, you have nonlinear PDE, the Einstein's equation, and it's a very hard problem to generically solve. Um, and in fact, it doesn't just stop here. Um, from effectively the beginning of GR, there were some reasonably solid Novo theorem of why you can't have solitons in just four dimensional uh, gravitational theories. Um, if, a, if, a, if, if, if a solution is asymptotically flat, topologically trivial, and globally stationary, meaning no horizons, we, there is a theorem that tells you that it must be flat. Right? You cannot have localized lumps of gravitational energy, which you might consider something like an equivalent of like a blue ball for, for gravity. So we don't, you, you cannot have that in four dimensional space time. So you need to do something different if you want to make any hopes of this. For one, the fact that we can make them in, in string theory and supergravity already implies there should be ways to go around these no-go theorems. The topology, so like a, like a normal black hole, the non-trivial, I'm just trying to understand how a non, like a normal black hole evades that statement. It's, it has a horizon. 
So that, that's the topology. Not globally stationary. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so globally stationary means you have a globally, you have a single global uh, time like getting vector that is nowhere vanishing. So, all right, then violates that. So, you can avoid these, these no go theorems. Um, and the way which sort of a, a supergravity and string theory avoids it is that usually when you have localized objects that are purely gravitational, they, there are interesting topology that exist. They, they have to be supported by something, usually by Maxwell type fields. Uh, there could be other uh, interactions that appear in the gravitational theory. And more often than not, you always need extra dimensions to create some localized lump if in, 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 in of various kinds. So if you want to then try to think about this, so, so the, the, one of the interesting observations is that having these different features itself was independent of supersymmetry, right? So, 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 so which suggests that if you could, that there might be actually a chance to do it beyond uh, the supergravity and supersymmetry regime, which is really the question that we want to answer here. So, since you need extra dimensions, then you want to ask what is the simplest of these things you can construct and how could you construct it? So you can consider a background, which is Minkowski with some circles. This is a 4D Minkowski with some extra circles around. And pictorially, what you might imagine making, wanting is that you have on R3, you have some locus where the circles in the extra dimensions collapse. And depending how they collapse, they can create these non-trivial topological objects. Right? So the way you have some 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 cycles is you look, if you look at the zero section, technically you have some S1 that collapses in the usual way. So you might ask, could you construct geometries beyond in generic series of gravity without referring to all the edifices of supergravity, where you have localized regions where you have supergravity, where you have extra dimensions collapse and then generate for you uh, solitons, things that look like genuine solitons in, in, in the external four-dimensional space. Any, any questions about the motivation? So like, what is the dimension at which this begins? Like at five, you can already do this? Like one compact circle is enough to? Yeah, and this, this was already surprising, but I, I I will try to explain how this works. Okay. Is why you're saying that you want to find uh, solutions with no horizon? Um, I want to find a localized solution sitting there that is not a black hole that doesn't have a horizon, which you can think of as a state of the gravitational theory. So a horizon is a black hole, mm -hmm. and a black hole we, we usually think of it as an ensemble of many things. And uh, are there any bounds on like how big you can make them given that you have a S1? Good. So this, so I will explain okay. uh, as we go in the talk. And and uh, I mean, so those are broad motivations. I'll show you exactly how 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 these things are. We 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 found out how to build them and what are their physical properties and what and what you might learn from them. So they only have gravitational interaction. They have gravitational interaction. You will need electromagnetic flux to support it, and I'll explain that. And, but but that, but that, but that have not that does, that does not about the gravitational interaction, but it is just to make sure these things are at least metastable. So maybe let me let me explain, and then we'll we'll we, you can ask these questions again. They're all great questions. So to start, uh, I'll just jump right in to to explain how one might do this. Is let's let's consider four dimensional space just times a torus, um, uh, just two circles. Uh, it, I could make this object with just one circle, but two circles will be more interesting for reasons that, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll explain. But also from there, you can see where the, just the 5D one would, would, would emerge. So the, 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 the magic of how we do this is picking an ansatz, that, that, a nice ansatz for a six dimensional space. So we have the time direction with some warp factors sitting here. And then you have a circle, and then you have some four-dimensional base. This 4D base is an S1 over some 3D, and there is a field symmetry, right? So in our construction, we will always have axial symmetry. The reason why, and then we have electromagnetic field, a three-form flux that we allow in our system, 
um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to help us um, stabilize uh, our constructions. The observation from this sort of an answer is that even though Einstein's equations are incredibly nonlinear in, in, without any supersymmetry here, they reduce into different sectors. For example, if I look, so the labeling here where I have this warp factor Z1 with this H1, they decouple, their equations just decouple from everything else. Z2, which is this internal warp factor with this H2 also decouple to its own set of equations. And then some of these other components, this one just satisfy a simple Laplace equation. And then once you determine all of these different warp factors, then you find that you, you, you can fix the metric on the actual symmetry space. Okay, so the, the observation is that if I just look at an answer that looks like this, um, there is this rather than interesting decoupling of Einstein equation, uh, uh, which was not observed before. So for example, if I just pick one of these factors, I can write down the equations, it's still nonlinear. Um, but the exciting thing from this, this problem is that these equations here are actually familiar in other ways. If I pick any one of these factors that I have, they themselves correspond to vacuum Einstein's equation in four dimensions in equisymmetric background. Okay. So already if I take Einstein's equation in, 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 in vacuum, each one of these sectors, you can map to the equations one to one. And the reason why this is interesting is because all the things that we've known how to do solutions in GR has been based on these 4D Einstein's equation. And one of the exciting things about them is that, you know, all the standard black hole solutions are obtained from this 4D uh, set of equations. Um, these are known to admit a rather interesting interpretable structure, which is called the Gerog group. Right, uh, which have been used a lot in construct in solution generating techniques in, 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 in gravity. And the integrability structures can be implemented by like inverse scattering methods. It allows you to construct multi curve, multi rise and rush from black Saturn solutions. All of those different solutions follow from this single setup. So, what we observe is when we take this specific uh, setup that we, that we have in the previous transparency, it the, the, it, it becomes a system where you have different sectors with each one of those sectors are these equations which have a lot of interesting properties that have been studied over many, many, many years. So we can use quite a bit of work out there. So then to try to do what we want, for example, we want to construct a solution. Let's say we, we want to take this circle, we collapse it in some region, right? So then that fixes the boundary condition for us. In particular, it tells us that we want the warp factor Z2 to blow up in some region while the other potentials are held fixed and finite. And, and similarly, if we want the Y1 circle, there is a boundary condition here that this has to blow up while these ratios are finite. And you also do not want any horizons, so you impose this condition here. So what it means is that you, you look at the Einstein equations in this setup, they decouple into different sectors, and the only way these sectors will talk to each other is through the various boundary conditions that you want to impose. So you can go and then write down a set of solutions subject to the boundary conditions and ask whether you can make it completely smooth and what we did. So that's the idea. So now let's see how we build solutions. So first, to, to highlight the different construction that appears is the set of systems that we have here, there are two types of sources that can generically appear. Some of these have known, been studied very well. You can imagine on this axis that we have, you can put on point sources. And those point sources, you will generate point sources for things like Z and H fields, and they give you extremal solutions and BPS particles that we study a lot in many different contexts. But then there is new types of sources you can consider which are not BPS and not extremal. So these are sources which are rocks where along a region where these functions blow up in specific rod segments of this kind. And in fact, 
uh, this W potential satisfied uh, Laplacian on its log. So those will have sources which look like rods as opposed to point sources. Okay. So then you can try to think about how to discuss the sources for these different potentials along segments uh, where they either blow up or go to zero. So to just demonstrate an example, so you could so the, the different rod sources that you, then you can construct, they come in the following way. You can have a source over here where you collapse the time direction, right? So this would be, so you can treat the time direction as an S1. So you collapse the time like killing vector, so you can choose that boundary condition and you can tune solutions of those functions such that along this segment, the time circle collapse. And then what that does, it generates a horizon. You can have charges associated to such a horizon, which is some charge Q. But then you can also pick a set of boundary conditions, as I've described, where you where you don't where, where it's not the S1, the, the time direction that collapse, but you have one of these circles in your extra dimension circles collapse. So in those regions, what you get is a smooth bubble where space-time ends. Right? It's a, it's a, so in a horizon, you can there, there's a region behind the horizon by which you can study. But one of the interesting thing is if I collapse a space-time circle, then that's a region where space-time will smoothly end. Think of a cigar geometry. So then you can play this game where now we know how to solve these nonlinear equations. You can pick these various boundary conditions where you can have either the time circle collapse where it would be like a horizon. You can have one of the circles collapse where you would have a, bub a smooth bubble uh, 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 sitting there where space-time smoothly ends and is completely non-singular. So this would be a case where you get a bubbling geometry that mirrors the picture or the desired thing I, want, I was pointing out earlier. And then one thing you can also do is you can take all of these rod sources, you can sort of stack them. And when you stack them, you get the bubbling structures that sit on top of each other, which are finite in, in, in the external three-dimensional space. Okay. And, and finally, if you do not want a horizon, you can do the following thing. You can take a set of rod sources where along each rod, you collapse one of the extra dimensions in a, in, in a very particular way. So you can alternatively have rod sources where you have uh, these circles are alternatively collapsing and re-expanding. And whenever you can do this, you get a large bubbling structure that's sitting there into your external space-time that looks like a gravitational object. Okay. The geometry that you would get through this long chain will have no horizons and will have no singularities. Go ahead. Have you checked what kind of energy conditions these sources satisfy? So these sources satisfy all the standard the, the, the uh, energy condition. They're, they're not, they're not, uh, they don't violate energy condition because it's, it's exactly as taking a horizon and doing a wick rotation, each one of these things. So they're completely well behaved. Like the, there is, um, they're not so exotic as you might think. It's just like, it, it is the same sort of source which would allow you to take a, an S1 times R and then you smoothly shrink the S1 to get a tip of a cigar. That's completely well behaved in regular space time. The only difference is that here, when you do it in this higher dimensional region, and so what you get is a region where you have a bubbling, a, a two cycle that sits there. The zero section of this S1, you have a non trivial two cycle that is sitting there, which is non contract. So it's a topology fact that, that, that we allow, that we use, that, that we're exploiting in doing this. Okay. So then you can get this alternating sources of this kind, and you will build an object which is, which is of finite size. And you can think of this as a bound state of all of these different components that you put in here. Okay. So you could ask what happens if I Calusa climb reduce on these circles to four dimensions. In four dimensions, what you would get is a, is a, is a four dimensional black hole where the singular at the horizon. 
And then you can construct the field and understand all of its properties. But when you come very near to this object, then you would start to see the high D nature and then you open up to this bubbling structure. And then we'll just try to do some more. Okay. Are the four dimensional black holes you get extremal? No, they, 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 they don't have to be. They're not DPS whatsoever. So let me just do a one example to illustrate how these things work. Um, we can, for example, so, so part of, so, so here I've just described the, the idea of constructing, but what you would want to have an explicit metric that you can play with and study and do various analysis on. Um, you can consider a special case where you have these rod sources. So remember at each rod, you have a circle that's collapsing, but you can also, also associate some charge coming from the electromagnetic uh, field that is in this background. If we consider a family of rod solutions where their mass to charge ratio is fixed, then the equations will have a, the sum of the interoperability structure of the equations becomes immediate even at the level of, of themselves. You don't need to do any fancy background transformation to get them. This is the sort of same integrability structure that, that, that makes things that are called Majundar, Papa Petru solutions explicit. So in this case, where you have a sequence of rods where the mass and charge ratio, so the mass here is some mass parameter associated to the rods, um, is fixed, then you can solve this problem explicitly. And, and the only other constraint that you'll end up getting is because you have two cycles that are collapsing, you have to impose regularity conditions on this bubbling structure. And the regularity conditions you can think of as the force balance equations of these rods because they gravitate and they squeeze each other. Okay. So you can, for example, solve the problem explicitly and show that the mass contribution of each rod is going to scale as the number of, of rods or the number of bubbling structures to the minus three quarters times Ry, where Ry is the, is the asymptotic radius of the extra dimension. You can compute the mass explicitly of this thing and it will scale as n to the one quarter times Ry. So if you make many, many bubbles, you can make some very heavy object that's, that's sitting there. There is some charges that scale appropriately. So the, the RY is like the same on both of the circles? In this case, yes, but you can- But you, they can dial that as well. Yeah. So you can explore different things. So this object from the point of view of the four dimensional space is some ultra compact object, which will have a size that is smaller than it's uh, twice than it's short shield radius itself. So you can explicitly see what that is. Um, but there is, there is one sort of assumption that we have, which is that we assume that we can build a geometry that we can trust. So one of the things that happens is that as you, as, as you observe here, right, as you sort of put in more and more rod, they squeeze each other gravitationally. And this squeezing is also going to shrink their effective size. So you can ask how large n must be before you can trust this. So this is when their size which will scale also as the mass, is at the same scale as the, let's say the, the, the Planck scale, then you shouldn't trust these constructions. So in this example here, you know, you can, you can, you can make something that is, that has the same mass at the same order of, let's say an asteroid, for example. And this just follows from these instances. Another feature you can ask is, what does this thing look like outside the geometry? So it has some mass, uh, which could be large because you can take n large while fixing uh, the, rate, the asymptotic radius. The observation is if you just, so this thing, of course, as you might imagine, the metric is going to be highly non-trivial. An interesting observation is that if you look at a small distance away outside of it, let's say of the order, uh, n to the minus one half out, uh, outside from this thing, you observe that the metric dramatically sim simplifies. Right? It, it, the, the metric of the system dramatically simplifies and it simplifies to something of this kind. So, and this thing is a singular metric at r equal to two n. 
From an external space time, you would actually see even in the 6D some singular object which becomes regular, which becomes smoothed out when you come, in, you know, very, very close to it in, at the order of the size of the extra dimension. And then it would it will sort of change and become this, this solitonic object. To, to, to tell you more features of this thing, one thing you can do is you have this bubbling structure. You can, you can, you can, you can imagine that you have some bubbling structure sitting there. You can imagine taking a bunch of concentric spheres around it. So, and ask what is the size of this sphere very far away. So this would one, one way to think about what the radius is. And then you ask, as you come very close, to this bubbling structure, what happens to the to the to the area of the spheres? So this is we we we, we, we plot here. What you see is that uh, very uh, away from this object, the area of the spheres are large, uh, are going to behave as you might expect uh, uh, in, in 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 the given space. So they will continue. The area will shrink. But then, when you come very close to these solitons, the area blow up. So, which means that when you come infinitesimally close to these solitons, the region near the soliton have a larger surface area than actually immediately outside. So there is this expans expansion of space that is happening. And if you and you can compute these areas uh, of the solid in, in the smooth soliton solution, you find that by the time you get to the actual solution, you get you, you can compute this exact area, which is much larger than immediately outside of it. So the dotted line here is the area is computed in the singular geometry. And this demonstrates that the outside geometry that you would observe, which it would be this simply singular thing, approximated really well. So here we see it approximated really well until you come very, 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 very close to this bubbling structure. So you wouldn't know until you write on it. Right? Is there an explanation for like the entropy in terms of like state counting of distributing rods to good? Phases? So we can we can talk about those points points later. Yeah, good. So if, uh, this this is a question of what is the proper interpretation of these objects. Yeah, yeah, we can look at that. Later. This is me not knowing a lot about <clears throat> these type of solutions. But so if, if I took just a big ball of matter far outside, it would look like a black hole, right? And then I would, at, I guess, at some point, start realizing that it's actually, say, a star. Yeah. Symmetrically does it have this type of feature? That's exactly the point, right? Far away, it looks like some some black hole type object, but you wouldn't know it is that until you like write on it. At what distance away from it? At a, at the distance of R y, at the distance of the extra dimension. That is the scale by which you would be able to distinguish that there is something else there, not a singular horizon solution. But the area grows very fast again as I start yeah. getting close. Okay. Yeah. So it's like it's, it's a statement is bigger inside than outside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to this thing, we 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 dub this phenomena a bag end phenomenon mm -hmm. where the space time looks well behaved, but somehow when you come in here, it sort of opens up and there is a lot of structure sitting there. There's a lot of structure that's sitting there. Okay. So uh, to this picture of, of, of how we should think about it. Another way to think about this is that I, I have this sequence of rod sources. So the, the, the singular geometry that I described, which approximates this geometry outside, is also an exact solution to Einstein's equation. But it's an exact solution where you have a singular, where basically in the region where you have rod is, you just stupidly collapse all the different extra dimensions. So you get a genuine singularity that you have there. So you can, you can construct a solution where you just stupidly collapse the whole extra dimensions in a region, which would be a singular solution. And that metric looks very simple. But when you come very close, you can resolve such a singularity by, by having this bubbling structure that sit there where you organize the extra dimensions to collapse in a nice and consec consecutive way. And then that is the resolution. So this is a bubbly resolution of this singular geometry. Okay. And in fact, whenever I give you some singular structure like this, you can write down the solution exactly, which looks like this. So this is a solution where you have a horizon when Z1 collapse in the region of here. Uh, but 
you also have all of the other extra dimensions collapse. And then this gives you a singularity at the level of the horizon itself. And then you can modify all of these functions a tiny bit uh, in, in some way, and they will correspond to the smoothing procedure where you smooth out the, the, the baselines. So, so with this in mind now, so we have a method and machines to just build bubbling structure where very far away, you, it looks like uh, a smooth geometry. You could ask, can you start to make certain things that might be a bit more interesting for people? Can you, for example, construct what you might call a short shield soliton? Meaning in all of the picture that I have so far, those carry charges, can I make a solution which is net neutral outside where I understand where, where, where if I come nearby where the short shield horizon would be, it would be some smooth geometry that becomes something else. Okay, so it turns out what we can explore here, we can use inverse scattering methods for, for two different sectors of Einstein's equation. It's not necessary to go through those details. You can use inverse scattering methods to actually solve the equation explicitly. And the picture we, we could ask to have is you can have a tree bubbling structure, right? Where you have a bubble in the middle, which we call a vacuum bubble. And then outside, we have a bubble of charge Q and a bubble of minus Q, okay? So in this, in this, in this structure, in the middle, one of the circles collapse, and in the outside, the other circles collapse. So this has a net charge of zero. You can, uh, so, so, so constructing this, this metric is highly non-trivial because we, we use this inverse scattering method, but we can write it explicitly. So this is what it would look like. Right? You could write it, you can give it to a student to play with, you can think about it as you wish. Okay. Um, to just sort of, I, I showed a lot of pictures, it's always good to show an exact result. Uh, but it's rare when you can get exact results in Einstein's equation, and this is an example where you can do it. And our method allows you to do that. So one of the observations that we have is, is all of these constructions, we can uplift it uh, to, to, to We can, we can uh, so soon after we understood these mechanisms of, of constructing these solutions, um, we find that the 6D solution, we can actually uplift it on type 2B supergravity in T6. So this is, we can put it within string theory. And when you put it in string theory, you can try to understand what are the degrees of freedom that make up these, these, these constructions. And in particular, one of the things observation is, if you look at the outer bubbles, that, that, that in this three bubble solution, you can imagine shrinking those rods to zero size and asking what happens. When you do that, you get a singular point and the north and the south pole sitting on top of a vacuum bubble where the extra dimension, where one of the extra dimensions shrink, giving you the bubble. And then there is a point here where you have uh, actual singularity in the metric but these singularities, you can then zoom into the region in type 2B and actually find they correspond to D1, D5 uh, 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 particles in, 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 in string theory. So what you then have is that the, what the solution would look like is like a vacuum bubble where you have extremal particles that are suspended at the pulse. Okay, so this is how we can start to understand what these degrees of freedom are from a, from a theory of, of, of gravity. And one of the things that you can sort of map out is the redshift to actually see what's happening. So when you have the bubbling geometry of this kind, you get the redshift, you have a, a large redshift factor uh, similar to what you would expect for a gravitating object. And then when you go to the limit where you shrink these, BPS, these things to BPS particles, you get a D1, D5 bound state here and another D1, D5 bound state here. And indeed, if you look at this metric here, it has some talks to an ADS3 times an S3 in, 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 in the type 2B geometry. Okay. So from this back end structure that we described, as you have these minimal surfaces come in, there's a minimal surface before this thing opens up. This minimal surface, you can think of as the characteristic side or the mouth of this object. And those, in the case for this, 
Here, the minimum surface is like 1.52, the short shield radius, so you can completely associate um, a size to this thing. Okay, another thing you can do to try to better characterize, to understand what these geometries do, so I showed you the metric and it looks quite hellish, so you want to understand what are the properties of these space times. One thing you can do is, um, is sort of do, ask what do they look like in the sky by doing some geodetic characterization. So here, this is a picture where there is a celestial sphere, you're sitting over here, and then you put the object in the middle and there's the back panel from which is, you shine light, right? So there's the back panel where light is coming from. So when it comes, comes through the surface, it gets lensed in some way. So if there is no object sitting there where you just have a flat space, you would just see the back panel back from, if you're sitting as an observer here. But suppose you put a short shield black hole in the middle, then you would get a shadow for the short shield black hole beyond which you don't see anything. The shadow is larger than the horizon side of the short shield. So here you see, for example, the light coming here gets lensed around the short shield and then comes in from this side, the yellow. Similarly, the blue here comes, gets lensed and show up here in the green and the red. So this is, this is a way of mapping some lensing phenomena that's appearing for this guy. So you could ask what happens when you do this with these solitons. What you observe is that you, you to first order, the, the, the lensing property looks very much like you would expect from a Schwarzschild solution. And in fact, the, 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 the boundary here that you would get is, is the boundary of the Schwarzschild with a little bit of changes, which, will, which, which I'll say a little bit more. However, because you have a structure that is sitting there that is like a star of finite size, some of the lights can scatter within this object and then come out another, later. And then you can see this rather non-trivial scattering of light, uh, of the light from the back panel that enters the structure and then at a later time come out. Right? So it's a very rather distinguishing feature. And somehow from the outside until, uh, you know, until you come very, very close here, it looks like the, the lensing property is exactly like the short chip. Uh, and do you have an estimate for how long it would take for a light ray to, you know, that enters the black hole to, to leave? Or yeah, to so it's a very, so, so as you can see here, when the light enters, it's cramped, it, it gets non-trivially scrambled and, 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 and it can take a long time to, to, to come up. Is there like, a comparison of like the absorption cross sections compared to the black hole because this has like this seems like a brighter object than the black hole. It is it is brighter but slightly brighter, right? It, this is just a statement that light that comes in after a sufficient time can come out, but this is a very very long time scale. Uh, is so, it like exponential in the? I see. Yeah, it's a very very large time scale before this light comes out. But the point is that if you're just looking at the scattering, each one of these dots is just saying that. If you have a light with an impact parameter that is small enough that enters, you can see it come out. But where you know, but where it comes out is a very chaotic pattern because the geometry of this thing inside is highly non-trivial. So it really visits it and then scatters around in various ways, and that then later come up. But the cool thing here is that if you look at the outside, uh, where you have where you have the boundary of this thing is this, is the boundary of the shadow of the short chain. In fact, you can sort of do something you can superimpose. So suppose I have a backdrop of light very far away. I'm not sure whether you can see this very well. You can, you can then put, ah. So this is like what a lens of a short shield look like. And then this is what the lens of this thing looks like. So first you there is a short shield lensing around, and then there is a lensing of this. So if you notice in this, in this, in this movie, you can see that the outside kind of gets squished a little bit, whereas the equator part is more or less fine, right? And that's because these things have dipole moments. So, sorry, the, 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 if the gravitating object has a quadrupole moment, but the field, the electromagnetic field that supports it has a dipole moment, and then there's a quadrupole moment, and the quadrupole moment that you, what you see is what just kind of squishes it a little bit, right? 
it's a, it's, a, it's a very tiny effect. And then on, in addition to that, you have all of the brightness from inside that can come out. So this light that is, that is sitting here, it, 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 there's a long de de delay time, but it also has gets suppressed by the redshift factor because when it enters, this it, it, it back reacts because it will be a high energy mode near it, it will back react and then come out at a later time. So there is a further suppression by, by, by a redshift factor on the surface. Okay, good. So, so, this, so that was the sort of first exploration of these things. But now you can ask also another question, is there a meaningful way of talking about resolving the short chill horizon, right? Meaning, Meaning, can I have a something where it looks like a short shield for the most part until you write on the top thing? And how would you construct that? So there are three, there, there, is, there is a panel here. So for the way we, so, so this we, we constructed recently in a paper. First, take a short shield black hole, and then we add a scalar in the short shield background. And, and the scalar would be singular at the horizon because of the no hair theorem in four dimensions. Okay. So the effect of that singularity is that the scalar pulls the singularity at the middle and pulls it out all the way up to the, to the horizon. We call this the scalar wall solution. Um, and in fact, the scale, we can write this metric exactly. It looks almost like a short shield with some deformation here, H alpha, which looks like a quadrupole deformation on top of the short shield black hole. Okay. And then there is a scalar, which has some profile F, which is the same F here with some power alpha and alpha is the same power that appears over here. What, what type of, is it the field just gets really large or like the energy? Well, the field goes as F of R, right? So, so, so it's blowing up, so the stress tensor is blowing up. And because the stress tensor blow up, then the curvature blows up. So it is generally singular at the horizon. But you're replacing, so you, you, you have a horizon, but it's single. The curvature goes up. Yeah. Um, but you, uh, good. So, so first, what we will do is, let's take this, this, this scalar hair solution, which is mostly Schwarzschild, except there is a scalar profile near the horizon. We can uplift this scalar hair solution straight into uh, for example, 11 d supergravity, where it just becomes some vacuum solution of, that looks like this. So this is a vacuum solution where we're collapsing the extra dimensions along the region of a rock. So we're just doing a complete collapse of all the extra dimension in the region where this black hole would be over here with some weights that are given by D. So these weights is what determines this power alpha in this quadrupole function h. Okay, so this is something we can do. But already, uh, as we pointed out earlier, if you have something where you have rod sources that are singular, meaning you have several extra dimensions that are collapsing, there is a way to smooth out those rod sources by organizing how the extra dimensions shrink. And in fact, and you can do that to first order, and the metric is actually, you can write it down quite simply. So we can take this singular region, we can replace it with a one large vacuum bubble where we collapse the one of the circles, Y2 here, we just collapse it here. And then at the poles, uh, what, what happens at the poles is that the poles will, will become a singular points. And, the, and, and those singular points there, is, you can check is a singularity where you have an M2 brain sitting there in M theory and an anti M2 brain sitting there in the, down here, right? So this is a bound state of two M2 anti M2 uh, uh, particles sitting on top of bubbles. Okay. You might work, so of course, describing it this way is, is, is rather cartoonish, but the geometry here is highly non-trivial, except when you zoom into the poles, you actually get uh, the metric of a singular M2 brain sitting there. And then you can understand it exactly. And you can understand this from the chart. So for this system, you could, for example, compute all the parameters in this with in terms of the mass of the, of the object. 
for one, you see that um, all of the parameters are given in terms of two asymptotic numbers, the asymptotic mass and the asymptotic radius of the extra dimension. Okay. So, so in particular, you see that the deviation from the pure vacuum is fixed by, F, by this parameter epsilon naught, which you go as Ry over Ry squared over M squared. Okay. So what this tells you, and then you have a quadrupole, you have a dipole for the for the for the four form flux in M theory. So the electromagnetic field has a, has a dipole given by this J. And then the, the dipole goes as the extra dimension itself uh, 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 times the mass. And then you can compute the number of flux units sitting at the poles, which also count the total number of M2 brains and anti-M2 brains sitting there. So you so so the observation here is that as you make your extra dimension actually very very small, this geometry looks more and more like the Schwarzschild background, and the deviation from which you would see it with respect to the Schwarzschild or the scalar hair is at a scale of R y because that is the thing that is fixing the deviations from from the black. So if I had a black hole that was spinning, wouldn't like the dipole radiate like the q minus q chart system yeah so these are not spinning and we don't yet have a controlled way of making them spin i see right I see. so in fact we have solutions where we add spin but then there are going to be there are pathologies in the geometries which we can't remove yet wow okay so they have to be like act like not only axisymmetric but like there's no so there's no spin here yet there's no spin here yet okay but 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 the but the point is, is that you, you, you have this bound state of an M2 and an anti-M2. You can think of the bubble that's sitting in there as, as, as a sort of the equivalence of a... So, so another picture that might be similar to this is a meson, right? Where you have a quark and anti-quark, and then you have a flush tube inside, yeah. okay? You can, think of, you can think about this bubbling structure here. This bubbling structure is, is, something, to, is something of topology, which you can think of as, a, as, as some non-trivial, uh, uh, coherent configurations of, of, of gravitons. So, so, so this bubbling structure is sort of playing the role of like flux tubes. Okay. And, 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 the, and the point is that because of the way this, met, this thing looked like, you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from what you might call a Schwarzschild until you are at a RY away from the horizon. And that is the sort of interesting result that we get here. Whereas even though, but, but, but if you make the mass very large here, N is very large, but N is the number of M2 brains. So you have very, very large number of M2 brains sitting at the poles where, where the is net neutral from outside. And then if you dial Ry to zero, the dipole also shrinks very zero because it's more and more spherically symmetric. And then in the final step, you can ask, can I resolve these M2 brain singularities? And this you can do by replacing these point sources to some rod source. Um, and when you replace those rod source, they just, they, the, 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 the M2 brains get replaced to some, by, by, by some bubbling geometry. And when you do this, the, 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 the units of charge that you have gets replaced to some units of flux. In the, in the standard geomagnetic transition picture that we are familiar with, okay? And then the geometry that you would get here now is completely smooth, where if you shrink this bubble, it goes to this singular thing, which then everything becomes more and more look like a short chip. So here you can also compute all the parameters and you find that they, they depend again on the mass and on the size of those extra dimensions. So by, by dialing them, you can study various regimes of these objects. But there's one interesting subtlety here now, when you bubble the, the original M2 brains that you have here with some charge, they also have some regularity conditions that you need to impose. And when you impose those regularity conditions, what they do is they, they, they put a bound on the mass here, okay, in terms of the RY. So this bound, there is a very physical way to understand, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, but another thing you can do when you replace these M2 brains with bubbles is that you can also allow orbifold singularities to sit on those bubbles. 
Okay, you can make them regular, but you can make the circle shrink in a way that also have orbifold singularities. So this introduces another topological parameter K. And the way you think of these orbifold singularities is that they correspond to adding Gibbons Hawking bubbling structure. Right? So you can add Gibbons Hawking bubbling structure on top of these bubbles, and then that's just what you that, that's what they correspond. So you can scale to a number of bubbles too, and then when you scale them, it allows you to have a larger mass. And the physical picture that, that appears here is the following: is that the way you should think of each one of these bubbles, their correspond, you should think of them as some coherent state of, of, of gravity that is there. So when I'm making these geometries, I'm making bound states of coherent states of gravity. And naturally, if I want to construct a large object, right, I need to have a bound state of large number of, 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 of elementary particles, okay? So if I just have a system which have just three elementary particles, I shouldn't be able to create a very large object. And this is exactly what this signif signifies this bound and also answers your question here. What is the interpretation of these things? But if I allow these orbifolds, then I also have additional bubbling structure there, which is the, which is the, the, the Gibbons Hawking bubbling structure. So if I have K of them, I, that also corresponds to adding K minus one smaller bubbles at the north and the south. So you add more degrees of freedom to the object. And when you do that, it allows you to then increase the mass and scaling. Okay, go ahead. So, I mean, is this going to be pushing the flux tube analogy too far to say that this kind of exhibits a sort of gravity mediated confinement kind of property? Or it sounds like that. Uh, um, uh, if, if I want to say confine, confinement is more of a full property of the theory, whereas this is more of a bound state, mm -hmm. right? It's certainly in the confining theory, you have this fork, anti fork bound state. Or let's say if I tried to enlarge the thing uh, by pulling the ends apart, would you expect some sort of a pinch off, like a Gregory of Laplan type instability? But so, good. So, Gregory of Laplan instability will come when the size of these things is at the scale of the radius Ry. Mm -hmm. um, but but if you try to pinch them off, um, uh, what you're asking is what happens to the middle bubble, yeah. right? So I'm not sure I can make that analogy perfect that where I would where, where I would nucleate new particles that is there. I don't think that is quite correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. There isn't like a Lucia term that you would associate to the interaction. Actually, this is an interesting question that we're trying to understand now. So if we treat these bubbles as like individual particles, um, can I write down some effective theory uh, by which then I can reconstruct these bound states? And then there is a place where you could ask whether there could be like a Lucia term or anything like that, but I'm not sure I could say that. Okay, so you can also image this, 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 this model here. So, you know, it's, a, it's like, this is a picture and this is what it would look like in the sky. So this would be the short shield you have the scalar hair solution, which is the one where you, you have uh, the singular M2 brains. And then this is the fully smooth one. So you, you see these three lobes, which roughly corresponds to the three bubbling structures that you have in that geometry there. And the sizes of these boundaries are more or less the same as the short chill. So here we also did uh, a picture where we have um, an accretion disk that we put in and then inside you could you 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 have features that look like you know for the short shield for the resolve guy uh, that light that goes in from the accretion will also come out at some point but suppressed uh, due to the redshift. Uh, this is these things are much clearer in my computer than up there. Um, so the the second one, the short shield uh, scalar wall. So the the lensing doesn't look too different no. between the two. Even though I guess in the first one the curvature doesn't it's like totally fine with the horizon, whereas it blows up with the that, that somehow doesn't affect the lensing. No. Yeah. Uh, because the lensing, the shadow is not at the horizon. The shadow is like uh, is is a um, is a is a is a is a position where you have unstable light orbits. Right. right? That's, That's what the determines uh, the shadow, which is slightly out. So there, there, is an, there should be an effective field theory picture that tells you that if you have an object that is more compact than the short shield horizon, probably the shadow will be almost like a short shield uh, with, with some deformations due to the quadrupole. 
uh, such a theorem doesn't exist. But these pictures are much clearer and sharper in the screen than there. And they're more pretty. Uh, one of the things that you would observe is that there is a bit of quashing here uh, compared to the short shield, which is perfectly round. This thing is slightly squashed, and this one is slight, slightly quashed due to the quadrupole moment that you look at. All right, so I'll, I'll end here. So, 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 so one of the other things that we can do is that we can construct these solitons in ADS. Why is that interesting? Because when you put it in ADS, then you can use ADS CFT to actually try to more sharply understand how, how there are states in a theory of gravity. You can study their stability object, which is a very interesting problem that, we, that we're working on. You can try, you know, some of the things that we want to understand the general phase space of these objects in string theory and, and, and in various other places. Uh, what is the full spectrum of them that we can discuss? There is a lot of interesting GR uh, tools and techniques we can still use to learn more. There is more inverse scattering, backing transformation, and other things. And one of the other questions that we ask is that we want to push this picture of the phenomenological picture to ask how is this really different? How would it look compared to black holes and other, other sort of a thing in the sky? Um, and if there was something that would deviate from a black hole, um, um, this sort of object can allow you to understand what sort of observables you should look for and try to. That I will stop here. Thank you. So let me let me ask me about stability. Very good. Um, so there's no there's no obvious tachyonic modes that make the the rods want to contract or expand. Or... Good. No. So so good. So so so. For the single, if I just take a single rod, um, you can study, you can, you, you, can, you can study its free energy and you can really try to study stability properties. There is some range where it is stable and another range where it is not. And then you can, you can fully characterize it. In fact, the stability, so let me, let, okay, I think I have some slides like that for the single rod case. Ah, good. So the single bubble case, like if I just take a single rod, single bubble, the metric is actually very simple. It's like a short shield with an S1. So this should be reminiscent of the Witten bubble of nothing, right? But it's the Witten bubble of nothing with charge, which carries some charge. So you, what you, you can um, then compute the free energy of this guy, and it has a landscape like this. Right, as compared to the parameters, which are two, two parameters in the, in the thing. So there's a, there's a landscape of, of stability, and there is a tachyonic mode. There, there's, for, for, for one choice of the parameters, there is going to be some tachyonic mode. And this is the same mode that is present in the Witten bubble of nothing. And then, because you have the charge, you, you get another metastable point sitting there. Okay. And one of the interesting things you can directly observe is that there is an extremal limit, which we talked about, right? Where you, there is an extremal limit. And when you do take the extremal limit, the metastable, the unstable point goes away to infinity and this thing becomes exactly stable. And at the, and, and, and this extremal limit, you get an ADS3 times S3 uh, 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 solution. But, but, but in general, it can tunnel after 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 some time right so this is the thing that that this is a, what what is this is what the charge buys you if i have no charge then i just have the witten bubble of nothing phenomena where this thing is unstable but but by by allowing to have charge then i can have a non-trivial landscape where these things could be uh, are these things hawking radiate they appear state, so they shouldn't hawk and radiate. But one thing you might imagine the 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 so so this so another the more physical way to, to think about it is that um, relating to the stability here, you should think of this as if like you have some complicated object sitting there, which is going to fluctuate and tunnel to many different other objects. 
and you do an instantaneous freeze of what it looks like. So this is what this this is the picture that you should have. The question that you could ask is then if I dump some light, some radiation here, these things can absorb and and deform a little bit, and then at a later time radiate that mode. So that mode that it would radiate, that would be like the analog for, for Hodgson radiation. But it might not have an exactly thermal spectrum. Or it shouldn't, and it's not going to. Is there any implication of big variety conjecture on the type of solid bonds you can construct using those charged rods? Not immediately yet. We haven't checked, but but I expect the the the, 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 the that it should be. Meaning, basically, what you're asking is, can I understand the um, um, uh, the charge to mass ratio more more precisely? Yeah, or putting the charge to mass ratio, does it rule out any of the uh, solitons that are stable or that you, you particularly want? Especially, especially because you also talk about lifting the solution to the to the supergravity yeah. and uh, and to an end time to bound states. There, people naturally talk about regularity conjecture. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't have anything super smart to say, but certainly you, you we should think of it as another state, which could be a, a channel. Of, of an object that could be emitted by a black hole. Could you say a bit about like uh, like the resonant mode, like quasi normal modes, and yeah, we have a paper that's coming out soon. But I, I um, the so good. So so one of the things that you can that this allows you to study is that if you have these geometries, you know, there's a question of a regime where they're stable. There's a question of a regime where they can have actually multiple light rings. And those light ring could be stable right ring or, or unstable light ring. So one of the things that you can show is that similar to this picture that we saw that the feature outside the light ring looks like a black hole. This actually carries. So if you look at the mo the, the quasi-normal modes, so if you look, if you try to compute quasi-normal modes, you will find that there will be some that would be localized in the inner light ring, some that we look like in the outer light ring, and so on. Uh, the one that look like to the outer light ring look are exactly the same as the black hole. So, so this you know shows you more that this looks very much like the black hole. The ones that are inside are are going to be much more long lived, and then you can get like cavity effect inside, and then you can get the phenomena of echoes among other things. Um, but this already shows up at like low modes, like two two ones. Good. The 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 the, the short term modes are always going to look like the black hole modes, and then the higher modes are going to now probe to the other things. So you had some uh, something to say about ABS solitons, right? Yeah. So so what what would be a CFT description of? Good. So in that case, we constructed this, what we what we show that if you take the the ADS3 S3 dual to the D1 D5 CFT, mm -hmm. uh, which is BPS. Mm -hmm. You can put solid T solitons there, which is non BPS. So you should think of this as a non BPS deformation of those. So, so it, it is an interesting question to then understand what are the non BPS states mm -hmm. that, that, re, that we're turning on in this D1 D5 CFT. The fact that we, we have the CFT to work with it was yeah. already interesting. Yeah. Yeah, if no other questions, but... oh, please. Yeah. So the, the reason I think about them as pure states is because they don't have a horizon. Is that, is that basically the point? So like uh, you, you said that like the idea, I mean, this might be wrong, like that, like up to some resolution, this indeed look like black hole states. So then like, you know, I mean, uh, so, so like, how how do you like you know is eigenstate thermalization hypothesis something that you would be able to use to differentiate between in, in a CFT? I mean, like, uh, but but so that works in a in a in a thermal system, right? So these things are never thermal. They, these are individual states. So I, I don't know how to think about. Well, in, in uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, you think of the thermal state as a heavy state. Right, I mean, as a single heavy, state. yeah. Uh, so, like, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how to use it here to, to, to say much yet, but this would be very interesting. Yeah. Just along those lines, like, kind of maybe a question you could ask is 
you know, if I send in some, you treat this as a background space time, I send in some generic state of a quantum field. Mm -hmm. how, how easy is it to distinguish the late time state of yeah. the stuff coming off from a thermal? Good, state? good, good, good. So this is part of relating to that is exactly this studying this quasi normal mode. Because the quasi normal mode is what you do. You send in some scalar mode, and then uh, in this case, it's an S wave, and then it perturbs it. And then you're looking at the radiation later and asking what is the spectrum of the radiation and what it should look like. Yeah. So this is a calculation we're doing. But that calculation so far, we can do it for the single soliton, which is spherically symmetric, because um, you know, then you still have ODEs and its system is separable. But to do it in the more generic case, we're trying to figure out how to do it. But this is exactly the sort of interesting question you want to understand. It'd be interesting to see if for a fixed classical geometry, you already have enough uh, kind of chaotic trajectories of the of the matter inside the black hole to mock up a thermal state. Or yeah, yeah, good. This is, a, this is a very interesting yeah, question. Or if you need like so this is tunneling between geometries. To yeah, exactly, like, because you have a, a very exactly. chaotic system there. You could be some ergodic argument that you can use should say that, oh, there's going to be a yeah. spectrum. That, that, is, that is an excellent question. So especially the fact that outside looks like a black hole. So you really would expect that even if I just take a single state, and I hit it with something and try to look at the outside radiation, whether it looks thermal. That that would be a really interesting thing to think. And in, and in particular, as you exactly say, if you can ask, does be looking thermal require me to be able to, you know, fast tunnel to other states? Because the generic thing is not going to be a single one of these states. The generic thing is going to be a, a large ensemble of these things where they're fast tunneling to this way, right? This is like a con single configuration, like the, all of the air in the room sitting there or something like that. Um, right, so this is, a, this is a question which I don't know yet how to do, but, but, but and the reason why it's not, we don't have a good answer is because if you look at the, the perturbation in the short tube like here, what you actually have to do, the, the, the wave equation that you get is some PDE of the two, two variables and we don't have a good way of solving it. One other thing that we're starting to do is exactly seeing if we can simulate those PDEs and trying to get, get, a, get a sensible answer. Even the single spherically symmetric one, it was surprising to see the structure of the modes when you do it. So hopefully this paper will come out in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so there's, these are very important questions that we want to uh, uh, sort of understand. Thank you very much.